Hello, I'm Rob, this is Martin. We're at Maltmiller HQ today to talk about fermented foods. Uh, the other week you put some photos on social media of you fermenting foods at home. Um, what made you just start trying to do this? I did. Well, I, I had a weekend where I wasn't do, really doing anything else. Um, we were knocking around in the kitchen and I'd had these fermenting jars at home for a little while and it was just a perfect opportunity to, uh, to get it done. I'd plus, I'd been to the market that morning and they had some absolutely banging fresh like vine ripened tomatoes. So I just took the opportunity, get them purchased and uh, yeah, let's get it done. How, how does someone start doing this? What's, what's the key things you've got to consider? Well, it's absolutely fantastic in as much as the, the kit that you need really is very small. So if you've got a, if you've got like a kilner type jar, you've got the equipment that you need. Um, it's easier if you've got one of the kilner type jars with the, with the little bubbler on top. So you kind of have a little valve. So, cause obviously you're fermenting, so CO2 is produced. So the little valve in the lid allows the CO2 to uh, come out of the jar. Are there any rules or limitations on foods that you can put in there? You've, that you found? Not really that I found, but obviously you've got the, the common ones. So common ones would be gherkins, which is fermented cucumbers, chilies, so that you can make hot sauce. So all the hot sauces that you can buy, and actually we sell hot sauces, they all come from fermented chilies. Okay. What about like sauerkraut as well? That's Sa similar. Yeah. Sauerkraut is, is, is similar. And yes, we've done, we've done sauerkraut and we're now Actually, the sauerkraut that we've done is ready to eat. So other than having time on your hands, what's the real driver behind doing this? Oh, I, I really enjoy the flavours that the fermented foods bring. So if you think, let's just take one of them, for example, take gherkins, just how flexible the, what you can do with the finished product. So we actually had hot dogs at work, yeah. um, stuck the hot dogs in the air fryer, and they're absolutely delicious, but they were so much better when we put a slice of gherkin on top of the hot dog. So... That was the, the real drive. We're brewers, you know, and almost all brewers that I know are also massive foodies. We're really into food and, and enjoying new experiences and trying out different methods and techniques. And this just falls right into that category of we've got the basic equipment to do it. Let's just get on. And, and the experimentation behind it is just super good fun. But you're talking about gherkins. That you're not talking about pickling them. What, what no. are you, how are you preserving them in this method? Yeah, okay, so we're talking about a anaerobic fermentation. So we are submerging the vegetables within a brine solution. So that's salt and water. Salt and water solution, or in some cases, such as the sauerkraut, you can draw out enough liquid out of the cabbage itself using dry salt so that the liquid comes out. And when you press it down in the jar, the liquid comes above the level of the above the level of the vegetable, so it's really important. And we'll go on to show you a little bit later on how important it is that everything that's being fermented, the whole of the vegetables that are being fermented, are below the water level, and there's nothing floating on top. Okay, so before we get too messy and too deep into this, yep. what equipment do I need at home if I want to have a bash at this? Okay, you can you can do it a really simple way jam jar screw lid or a kilner type jar um, with the opening lid but if you're going to do that you need to be really careful you need something that's going to push down the vegetables so that they're not poking out the top of the of the liquid and also you need to be able to burp them because you're producing co2 so it's same as any other fermentation you, right. you, you've got co2 being so there's, so yeast, there's yeast in there producing. Oh, it will be, yeah, yes, and bacteria that which yeah. that's producing CO2. So you need to be able to undo the lid and burp it. So kind of have to be careful recommending recommending that way. That you can um, not put the lid on it at all, and you can get a like a thin plastic bag, fill it with water, and gently put it on top so that it seals around the top of the jar. Okay. And it also acts as a weight pushing the vegetables down. And that's actually a really successful way of, that's a really successful way of doing it. Or you can go with purpose-made um, kilner jars for fermentation. So the actual jars themselves are uh, more or less the same, um, but they come with a lid with a valve in it that allows the CO2 to escape, but no nasties to drop in. So it's like a little silicon seal on exactly. the top. Yeah, 
Okay. Exactly that. So it just allows the CO2 to burp out. We also do the larger fermenting jars that come with a rubber top and a which was typical for us to see a beer type airlock or wine type okay. airlock, bubbler airlock that sticks in the top. Both those kits also come with weights. So the weights, you fill, fill the jar with the vegetables and the brine and then put the weight on top and that keeps the, keeps the vegetables below the level of the liquid. So before using the equipment, is there anything I need to do in terms of like cleaning, sanitizing, like, like my brew kit? Not as much, okay? Just hot soapy water to clean the jars themselves. Rinse the vegetables off and you're good to go. There's no need to do any of the sort of cleaning and sanitizing as such as we do in the, in the brewing world. And then the brine, is there any particular rules around the brine, the liquid that I'm going to be adding in? Yeah, 2.5% salt solution. Is it a specific salt or just table no, salt? No, any or? salt will do, but you need to the salt to dissolve in the liquid and the easiest salt to dissolve in the liquid is the tiny grain stuff. So that really fine table salt um, yeah, I find just what I haven't got to go buying the most expensive no, salt rocks if you, or... No, and if you've got, if, just use any salt that you've got at home. If it happens to have the bigger grains at home, that's fine. But you just have to make sure that you, uh, it's all dissolved in the, in the liquid. So that's and 5%? No, 2.5%. 2.5%. And do remember that it's on weight, not volume. Okay. So 2.5 grams of salt per 100 millilitres of liquid. There was a dry method you said with salt. Yeah, sure. Is, is there a measurement of salt that you're supposed to use? Okay, so with some of the vegetables, such as tomatoes, for example, I don't want to squash the tomatoes. I don't want to spit the skins and all of the juice and everything to run out of the tomatoes. So that's why I'm putting them in brine. But for things like cabbage that's got like a real tough um, texture to it, I don't need to use the brine. I can get chop the cabbage up, uh, slice the cabbage up thinly put it into a bowl, sprinkle salt on, scrunch it up so the salt gets into everywhere. Yeah. And if you do it for a couple of minutes, you'll realize that the, the liquid starts to get drawn out of, the, out of the vegetable. And eventually you can push the cabbage down in the bowl far enough so that it's actually covered in liquid. At that point, it's ready to put in the jar, squash as much as you possibly can into the jar, force the weight in on top and then do the cap up and just make sure that that liquid level is above the level of the cabbage, you're good to go. But So don't just keep adding salt. No, you don't need to just keep I mean, on adding salt. that will make it taste yeah, just like yeah, salty. Yeah, yeah, it just goes far too salty. So you- Just enough to draw the liquid. Yeah, I mean, for the, for the red cabbage, for example, it was about a tablespoonful of salt that I used for the entire red cabbage. And that was enough to be able to get it um, okay. to, draw, to draw out the liquid. So with that, you can do what red cabbage, white cabbage, as, which is sauerkraut, and kimchi. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Okay. One thing to note is that with along with the vegetables, I've not, I've added flavourings as well. But in past experimentation, it, it's really shown that those flavours that you add, the process of fermentation really, really enhances those flavours. So when you're adding the flavourings, such as to the cabbage i added some chili flakes but you've really got to take it easy because that really will enhance okay. the flavor of the flavor of the chili and you don't want that taking over from the actual taste of the fermented cabbage so rob what are we making cucumbers well you don't like cucumbers i know i don't like cucumbers but i really don't like cucumbers but i absolutely adore gherkins so that's like the difference that fermentation makes to a food where you can really really dislike it unfermented but once it's been fermented it is absolutely delicious just like a gherkin so what's the first thing we've got to do okay we've washed we've got these mini gherkin uh, mini uh, cucumbers we found in the supermarket that you don't like i don't like yeah. what i would really like to do is grow them myself and then but we're not at that stage yet anyway i found these mini ones in the supermarket so we've washed them completely uh we're going to place them in this that's a three liter jar we're going to place them in there okay. we're then going to pour over the brine solution okay so you weighed out some water and i've weighed out three liters of water and i put in 75 grams of salt and made sure that it's dissolved so we got three liters of brine at the correct solution so that's the 2.5 percent that you right exactly that we're also going to put in um some herb and a bit of spice into the like uh what what's going to go in there some dill some dill okay nice and I thought some coriander seeds, just a few, and 
a few mustard seeds as well. Okay, so let's get the cucumbers into the jar then. Okay. Um, you could just sort of bung them in, but I want to get as many in as possible, so I'm going to sort of line them around. You know, like... I guess that'll look nicer as well on the side in the kitchen. Right, Rob, so you've got the cucumbers in the jar, and now you're going to, what, add your coriander and mustard seed, was it, you were putting in? Absolutely. How much are you putting in? I've just guessed. Oh, you are just eyeballing it and Yeah, going. this is all, as far as I'm concerned, this is all experimentation, so I'm just... I'm urging on the side of caution, because like I said, it does enhance the, the fermentation, does enhance the flavour, but I've just eyeballed it. So okay. I, I guess there's, what, a couple of teaspoons of each in a, in a three litre jar. And I guess you can always add more if you want to, if yes. there's not enough flavour in there. Yes, but you know, it's, it's, it's experimentation. Also going to put some dill in. Okay. I'm not going to chop that up. I'm going to leave it whole. And my reasoning is it might start poking out the top of the liquid because um, I've noticed some light stuff. I, I used some basil in with the tomatoes and it, it was almost impossible to keep it submerged. submerged. Okay. So if that happens with the dill, I can, if I, keep, if I kept it whole, I can just whip it out. I reckon about that much. That's what, nine or 10 Yeah, about 10 stalks. 10 stalks, yeah. And I'm just gonna sort of put them in around. I'm trying to the, squeeze it in between the cucumbers. Yeah, and actually, to be honest, the act of fermentation does move stuff around quite um, quite a lot um, during the fermentation. Next, brine. So we're just going to tip enough brine in to completely submerge everything. Okay, so dill's in now. Yeah, we're going to just, as you can see, it's all, it's, some of it's floated to the top, but this is where the weight comes in. So we've got two weights here that come with this kit but as we said earlier you can actually use do the plastic bag trick if you've not got this kit okay so pop those in there we go so lid on and we'll top up the bubbler with this brine solution. Okay. And I guess then what you leave it just and wait, put it in a tray or something just in case it does get a bit lively. I would definitely put it on a tray. Yeah, it might get a bit lively. Put it in a tray and then we're going to leave it at room temperature. It doesn't have to be dark or anything like that. Just leave it at room temperature and you will start to see. So uh, we're familiar with fermentation. We know the signs, but for those that aren't, you'll see bubbles start to rise, start to rise throughout the jar. It'll also start to go a little bit cloudy, and you might see some yeast forming, forming around some of the vegetables in there. So a bit like the ones you've already got here that you started your week. Exactly like that, yes. Okay, so what we're going to have a go at next? Sweet corn. So sweet corn, what's the first steps, Bob? This really couldn't be any, any easier. So bag of frozen sweet corn i've let i'll let it defrost we've um, washed out our jars and like we said before just soapy water rinse them out that's it done so all we need to do is pour in our sweet corn so what's that you're putting in there bob uh so we've got chili flakes and coriander seed and again i'm urging sort of on the side of caution because i don't want it to be i don't want it to be too much okay. you can extract some flavors out of spices that are really over the top I've had them go soapy before, that, that soapy sort of flavour, and, and I don't want to do that again. So I'm just going to sprinkle that in, about there, and then we'll top up the jar with the sweet corn. We've got to leave enough room for the weights, I guess, as well, yeah? Yes. But also have enough so that the weights don't slip away. Exactly that. And actually, I found it best if you, when you're using the weights, if you actually have to force them in. That way nothing can slip above on top of the weights. That should do the trick. So that's one of that size kilner jar then, that's a five... 640 grams. 640 grams. So we just top up with our brine solution. These are our glass weights that have come with this preserving set. Okay, so 
And this is just about keeping the vegetables or whatever it is underneath the liquid. Exactly that. Fine. Now I've tried these, I've tried these weights both ways. You would think that the best way is to put it in that way, but actually I found that if you pop them in that way, it kind of works better to prevent anything slipping around the sides. So that's weight in. So now all we need to do is put this top on and this, is, this top has got one of those um, silicon type valves in it. Okay. So we don't need a bubbler with this one. Um, it lets the CO2 out, doesn't let any nasties in. So how long are you gonna leave this for, Bob? Oh, I've been really surprised by how quickly fermentation takes off. So I am gonna put them at room temperature on a plate, because this is gonna get a bit uh, fruity. I'm gonna put them on a plate. I'm gonna leave them at room temperature and after about a week to 10 days, I'll then put them in the fridge. Now this is the really important bit. The longer you leave it at room temperature, the more lactic it gets, the more tangy it gets. So there will be a point at which it goes past where you want it to taste. And obviously that is completely personal preference. I like it really quite tangy. Um, so it, between a week and 10 days. When you put it in the fridge, like a lot of other fermentations, it just really, really slows it down. And it will sit in the fridge the flavour will change slightly, but it will sit in the fridge perfectly fine for months on end. So Rob, any other tips that I should be taking home with me so I can have a go at this this weekend? Yeah, the biggest one, which has already kind of touched on it, is the fact that the vegetables really have got to be completely submerged. Because if they're not completely submerged, they're out in oxygen. Yeah. So you lose that anaerobic fermentation and you've got a really big chance that it will um, go mouldy. So what, any signs of mould, don't eat it. For me, I'm not that experienced in doing the fermented food, so my guess is if it looks like mould, I'm, I'm gonna get a shot of it. So it's really important to keep those vegetables completely submerged so that we've got completely anaerobic fermentation in there. Water's gonna come out the top or the brine's gonna come out the top. Um, so you really wanna put them, especially if they're on a wooden surface, you know, it's gonna soak in. So yeah, put don't really on want a, the beaver on a wooden surface. To definitely connect. not, no, no. So have that on a plate. As soon as the fermentation's finished, when it's in the fridge, that's it, it's, it's, it's neutral then, it, nothing's gonna happen. That's really great, Rob. You've given me loads of ideas to go away and have a go at this at home. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any ideas, comments, please leave them below, hit subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And actually, we've got, uh, been following a couple of other YouTube channels. One of them is Joshua Wiseman, and the other one is Pro Home Cooks. And they've done loads of content on all types of fermentation, including um, vegetable fermentation. So check them out in the links below. And of course, don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.